<laughs> I took us. Uh, all right, we're live. We're live. Uh, I just took us live. All right. <laughs> See you guys. Uh, Do you want to turn this on? Yeah, I got it. Awesome. So um, I just, uh, uh, all I heard is that I have to um, do those voiceovers sometime after three, my time. So my guess is I'll get a message. But until we get that message, we, we can turn uh, around and jump in. Uh, 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 how you guys doing? I just woke up, and so the reason I look like Bill the Cat when the video still came on, I'm still waiting for blood to come to most of my face. It's it's one of those. Uh... They said the most. Ep- what was that? Was that you, Justin? Yeah. Oh, you I said want to make sure we're live. Diamond Club. Yeah. Yep. 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 So, um, I cratered and I slept. Uh, as soon as we got off the phone, Justin, I went to bed, and I had one of those, um, one of those weird sleeps where it's like you know you have an early flight, so you wake up every fifteen minutes going, and then you're uh-huh. like, oh, I get to go back to bed, and then you're like, Hazu-ah. it was it was that all night long for me. But then, uh, but even then, uh, apparently you could do that a lot and still feel rested come uh, three fifty five in the morning if you start at. Uh, you know, eight thirty or nine o'clock the night before. If if it comes between cycles, I'll totally get that where I'll, I'll I will feel rested. You know, if I get it, like I'll get that startled, but like I'll finish a cycle uh, and then oh another cycle uh, and then I'm like oh and then I'm like I'm like no wake up like I like this. Well, my, my, the weird part is those moments where it's like you're convinced you you haven't been able to fall asleep and you're like, but wait a minute, I wasn't on the Oprah Winfrey show, so I guess I guess mm-hmm. I must have been asleep. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, let me hear. Uh, let's uh, let's set levels, and then we're ready. Check, check, check. Talking, 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 talking. Keep on, keep on going. Hey, what's going on? Hello, this is me. I'm talking. Yada Perfect. yada yada. Blah right. blah blah. And Justin or Andrew. Hello. Keep going. People, I'm leaving the microphone here. I'm sorry. I'm still waking up. <laughs> Hello, who's in there? Um, <laughs> I'm, All right, that's I'm, good. I got you around negative six, and uh, I am a little bit behind. Check, 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 check. Cool. All right. Waveforms look good. Um, got it. All right. You guys ready to ready to go? Let me finish yeah. writing my notes for the do, show. Or do we want to? I guess that gives us enough time to tweet real quick. Yeah. That's why I opened up a Twitter. Now that I think about it, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't just goofing around. All right, all right. <laughs> Putting Humpty Dumpty back together. <laughs> Did you see that tweet? No. Uh, yeah. Oh, you suddenly got quiet. Oh, I guess you're off mic. Yeah, sorry. I'm just off mic. All right. Oh, man. I just typed in. Oh, God. All right. <clears throat> um, I guess what I got to do is say live now recording weird things. <coughs> I forgot to hit the button that made me shut up. You tweet that guy choking on the desktop right now. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh I'm still glowy sweaty from my from my ride. Hi. Is this the wide angle or the, I guess this is the wide. Crazy. All right. I'm ready when you are gentle folks. All right. All right. All right. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Microphone stay. Ah! (laughs) <laughs> what, are, what, are, what are you, xenophobic? You're like, ah, that's not English. What? No 
don't want you. <laughs> what on earth just happened? I didn't really. I clicked on a page that was video. Um, no, don't play. So, Justin, have you uh, have you vacillated between it's too big, it's just right, it's too big, it's just right? Um, interesting we, choice of words there, Brian. I know. Well, it's, <laughs> well, it's funny like how quickly it switched. You're like, oh, it's just right. Oh, it's too big. So uh, it's just, just right. Oh, it's too big. I don't know. I mean, it's kind of my phone. Like, to be honest, I haven't really thought about it so much. Well, like, uh, uh, I guess yesterday was the first time I traveled with it. And so I went through the, you know, the ecstasy of, of having a big screen for when we're traveling and the fact that uh, I was able to listen to audiobooks all day long for 24 hours and virtually nothing moved on the uh, on the battery. But then also yeah. the agony of sitting in uh, a coach class seat with this thing just, you know, I don't know, just where do you put it? I mean, like when you're watching it? Uh, no, 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 no. Like, like when uh, uh, when I'm listening, it's like, you know, I can't leave it in my pocket and listen. I had to put it in oh. the pocket up uh, of the thing in front. It doesn't fit in your pocket? Uh, not while I'm seated with an with a uh, uh, headphone jack in there in the front seat. Or front pocket. Holsters. Mm -hmm. All right. You ready to go? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, we and I are. I want to grill you later, Bri, about your plus interactions. See how you oh, feel about oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I was like, I was like Google Plus? I, I didn't think you liked Google Plus. All right, ready? Three, two. Wait, wait, wait. Does oh. anybody like Google Plus? I do. But but then again, I was bought and paid for. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um is Google Plus still there? Yeah. It is. Yeah. Um all right, you ready? Ladies wait, and oh, gentlemen. No, wait, oh, are you ready? Three, two. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Maine. I just woke up, so I'm a little out of it. Joined by Mr. Justin Robert Young. Yo. Hey, guys. What's going on? And Brian Brushwood. Dude, I just, I just got off a plane, rode my bicycle, and while I was riding my bike, guess what book I finished? Spoiler alert, alert a nerd, a dirt, <clears throat> take two. I finished your book, Andrew. I loved it. I, I loved you. it, loved it, loved it. Thank you very much, Brian. I appreciate that. I like glad. Uh, thank you for it was it was I, I I just let me just gush really fast because it's funny because um uh You like, mean my book Angel Killer available now at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Audible, and other fine book places? Yeah, well that this is the first of your books that, that I've been able to catch on Audible. I I guess I take that back. Uh Justin, you read uh which one did you read that is on Audible? I don't think any of them are on Audible. Uh, I mean, there are there are audiobook versions of Grendel's Shadow, Public Enemy Zero, uh, Chronological Man. Well, for whatever reason, like uh, it's it's that ease of use going through Audible that made it yeah. possible. Because you know, it's like I bought the book, and the book's sitting in my bathroom right now, and it's like I never had a chance to read because I, I don't read printed words anymore <laughs> in, in your bathroom. Form. Bonnie, where's the Sears catalog? Yeah. Oh, use Angel Killer. <laughs> But 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 just the ease of, of that, you know, buying it on Audible and then having the convenience of listening to it. I got so scooped in. I'm going to have to figure out how to get your other books on on uh, on my phone to listen to, even though it'll be weird because it's just a Robert Young. But uh, but brilliant, brilliant work, man. I, I loved it. So many surprises and uh, so many things I didn't see coming. It was great. You know, Brian, if you like it, you can leave a review on Amazon or Audible. Oh, you know what? I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to go. I'll say it. do it after the show. Yeah, okay. You think we should talk about weird things instead? Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I will. And one self-indulgent. Well, the whole thing here is self-indulgent. Who am I kidding? Um, so I went to New York to do some signings. And I get off the plane. And the, like it's late at night, half asleep. I'm walking through the terminal. And they have the Hudson books, and I see that book rack they push out into the aisle of you know the walkway. And what do I see? We give up. My book. <laughs> I Our see Angel Killer there. I'm like, that's the coolest thing in the world. So I was like, that was that was like a high point. And then people ask, why did I go to like with traditional publishing? Well, because we could still do ebooks 
and because I could get books in places like that. So seeing my book and Hudson Books was cool. And then I found out this really cool thing. My editor says, did you, did you go sign them? I'm like, no. She's just, I mean, that would be like defacing stuff. That would be like you know, was, vandalism. Th- th- what's funny is that's exactly what I thought you were going to – I was going to ask. Like you just walk up with a Sharpie just start scribbling, and then when somebody tries to give you guff? So I, I – she said, no, no, just go up and ask. And so I uh, – when I was leaving New York, I went into the Hudson Books, and, and I saw my book. This time they had that rack, but it was pushed towards the back of the store. So I go over there, and I usually buy my book when I see it just because I'll give it to somebody when I travel or whatever. But I like – I go, hey, you know, this book's really good, I hear. Too bad it's pushed back here. Maybe it should be pushed out somewhere else. <laughs> she looks at me like, "What kind of weirdo am I?" Dude. I go, "No, I wrote, I wrote the book. I was just, I was just shilling." He's like, "Oh, cool!" And then the manager comes over. They were super, super sweet. Um, and then next thing you know, she pulls out a big tape stickers of author signing books. Says, "Well, why don't you sign them?" And so they have, like in most bookstores, they actually have stickers that say "author signed copy." So I just signed all the copies at the Hudson Books and. Uh, JFK at the uh, United Terminal. And uh, anyhow, so that was cool. That was a really fun experience. Well, and, and I think you really tapped on something that, that wouldn't have been popular or possible just seven or eight years ago. But the fact that you were able to get a deal with a traditional publisher that involved you retaining all the rights to ebook sales in your previously established uh, back catalog, you know, it's uh, just as we've seen a revolution in, in, you know, in television and in video content and in. Um, uh, music, you know, you, it used to be you signed everything away to the labels, and then you just got screwed forever in music. Uh, I think uh, I think nowadays there's an acknowledgement that that uh, personal brands have value, and that traditional publishers uh, get to cash in on that. But then also, you know, pers- uh, uh, publishers have distribution, which is of value to the artist. Yeah, I you know part of it it comes from sort of you know when I my in my conversation with Harper Collins, and they've been super supportive by the way. Uh, Bourbon Street Books is an imprint of Harper Collins. Uh, Hannah Wood is my editor there. She is amazing. And, and Harper Collins themselves have been fantastic. I could not have asked for it exceeded my expectations of what it would be like to work with a publisher. They've been giving me just full support, taking care of me. Hannah, again, she's a wonderful, wonderful editor. And the one of the things is that part of in the two way street is that like I said, listen, I'm a guy that I want to be able to keep, you know, I want to have an output. I want to produce a lot of stuff. But not too much stuff. And I've seen some guys who jump to ebook, many guys who are championing ebooks early on because of you know being able to get rid of the publisher, which in many cases that's the perfect situation for them. But they put out so much stuff, the quality level declined. And and that's the big because they're like, well, I can just sell anything. And yeah, but not everything that comes out of your typewriter should necessarily be in front of other eyes, even if you're an experienced writer. And so for me, I've had to, you know, my output's declined. I've been writing a lot, but I'm trying to write to the level that I want to be writing at. And yeah. so it's, it's not because the publisher's like, yo, you can't or do this. But also, like, I want to give them a window around the release of Angel Killer. The sequel to Angel Killer, they've already, they're already reviewing covers and stuff like that. And so they have a plan for that. I, you know. uh, what, one more thing, and, and this is a difference. I, I didn't realize this. Um, I'm pretty sure this is spoiler free since obviously you've mentioned there's going to be a sequel. That means obviously things are set up in the first book that, that, you know, we are, you know, awaiting resolution for in the second book. But, uh, I realize there's a fundamental difference with audiobooks where, um, in a regular book, you can tell the moment you're reading, you know, when you're creeping up to the end. And so, you know, that there's going to be some kind of punctuation, but in an audio book, you know, I'm just like, wow, how's this going to get resolved? How's that going to get resolved? And then all of a sudden it's like, um, you know, the book was over. I was like, wait, but this, this can't be the end. Like, I thought for sure I'd miss something. But then I realized, I was like, oh, wait, it, the ending snuck up on me because I wasn't, you know, aware of my progress through the book. I was just hearing the story and all of a sudden there was an appropriate place to end it uh, and still have awesome questions that remain un- unresolved going into a sequel. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's a self-contained story. Let's it is, it is, it is. Oh, but, but okay, yeah. but yes. Well, so is Star, so that. is Star Wars, though. You know, Star Wars yeah. is also a self-contained story. Yeah, and then it, but then it's like now that you're in this universe and you go, oh, this is interesting. There are other places and things that can go in in their characters here that we have we want to find out more about. But yeah, absolutely, and that's that is one of the. It, it's interesting. I have a friend that cuts movie trailers, and we have this conversation about what's interesting. In movie trailers is if you watch a trailer in a movie, you're a captive audience. And it can be whatever length it needs to be. You have there to complete attention. If it's on television, 
it has to be fast, get you in, pull you in, because if it's not good, people turn into the channel, and that reflects bad. And how these things affect different media is interesting. A written book versus an audio book, you know, I think at some point you might have people thinking like, you know what, maybe I organize things differently for an audio book. Maybe it's structured differently. Maybe it's the same story, but maybe you tell it differently. Well, and, and, it, and it certainly used to be that audiobook equals abridged and, uh, yeah. and full book equals full book. But you're right. I mean, there's, there's um, uh, different ways to tell stories. And of course, you know, pictures don't translate or maybe you write something slightly different to cover a visual element. At any rate, uh, uh, yeah. could, couldn't have been happier, was so engaged and so fooled by the setups. Uh, it was great. I, the, the, I mean, the trick is, uh, the, the whole book is filled with magic tricks, and uh, I would hear the setups, and I was like, all right, I'll bite, I'll bite Maine. How, how does this work? And then, yeah, and then I was like, oh, wow, that's very clever. It's a good well, thing you're you. an author and not an actual serial killer. Yeah. <laughs> so Brian calls me yesterday, we we're talking, and he, he makes that point to me that, you know, like, man, it really is great that Andrew's writing stories about a crazy serial killer and not applying these like murderous <laughs> methods. And I'm like, yeah, that's your reaction when it's a Harper Collins published book. Like, imagine what it was when it was an email attachment from my friend. <laughs> like, hey, read this. Like, oh, look, there's a, there's a crazy way you can murder people and try to make uh, the world go crazy <laughs> by opening up a space-time portal in their minds. And it's like, all right, that's a great story, Andrew. Let's sell it on ebook. We are selling this on ebook, right? <laughs> no, Justin, yeah, I wrote it for you. That was the plan all along. <laughs> Again. Um, so, gentlemen, speaking of media, speaking about that, uh, you know, right now Ebola is in the news, and I remember in the 1990s when Ebola was in the news and reading about the books, The Hot Zone, all those other stuff and, and that. And, uh, you know, it's very easy to, uh, to get out of control here, to get a little scary or whatever like that. But you know what? Uh, I'm glad we have responsible journalists on the case. <laughs> Andrew's holding up his iPad with the CNN headline that says, is it time to panic? <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? What? I, I flipped this open. This was a uh, uh, few days ago. This was four days ago. I open up my, you know, open up my news in the morning. CNN, is it time to panic? I'm like, Jesus. <laughs> Yeah, it says the only thing that could have made it more CNN was if it were just a poll with two options, yes or no. Yeah, no, <laughs> uh, yeah dude, it's a. Uh, uh, I picture the subhead. You know, is it time to panic? The subhead is. Please say it's time to panic. We really would love it if we could start panicking and make you panic. Yeah, and then like mm -hmm. I love this because right below they also have the wonderful headline: "Armed man shares elevator with Obama." Well, that we, Secret Service agents are armed and they share the elevator with him all the time. When a felon with a gun is in the elevator with our president, yes, that's when we worry. So, anyhow, uh, but back to the Ebola thing. So, uh, CNN, is it time to panic? You know, it's like... All television news is entertainment tonight. Like, yeah. However and, they want to, however they want to dress it up. Dude, all I don't even, I don't even call it entertainment tonight. To me, all television news is um, a reality television show. And instead of uh, having a pilot once every three months, they audition stories every single day. They're like, um, uh, this delightful Hispanic woman was killed. Anyone? No. Hmm. This blonde well, white girl was killed in a foreign country. Oh, oh, you like that one? Okay, well let's find her. Hey, we we got it. We got us on the hook. Well, and, and remember, this is also the online version, so technically it's not even the television version. This is the print version. Ugh. And it's, you know, they talk about the idea of, like, you know, I, like, I don't watch television news, or most of it, because any time where it's like, what deadly chemical could be inside your home waiting to kill your children and murder them? Find out at seven. Yeah. That's four hours in which my children, non-existent, could get murdered by this deadly <laughs> chemical. But the only way they're going to tell me is if I go watch and watch their commercials. And, you know, that, that's the thing that I hate. I hate that kind of the lead with, you know, what can kill you? We're not going to tell you. We have the space. We can tell you right now. 
There, but we really don't care. Man, I, do you remember who it was on Harmontown, Justin, who was talking about what if conversations in real life happened the way they do with reality news? I think what I is, heard that episode. Uh, so, so it's like basically if you're like, hey, man, you want to hear a messed up story about a dude who stabbed the, uh, eight people in the heart and set fire to their corpses? Because I got a really good story. And you're like, yeah, yeah, I want to hear that story. You're like, all right, first, let me tell you about the new iPod. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> There's a... Uh, I forget what law it is, but somebody observ- made the observation. Any every has headline that has a question, the answer is no. <laughs> and there was a you know there's the website that does the uh, uh, like whatever um, you know, like basically takes like BuzzFeed articles oh, uh, or whatever. Hole? What's that? Clickhole. You're talking about the the Onion parody site. No, it's the one that's a, just a Twitter feed that just does like it tells you the the, oh, the save you a click. What, Sa- saves saves you a it, click? Yeah. Say it again. Uh, it, it's at saved you a click. So yeah, at saved you a click. Whenever there's a headline or whatever that says da 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 da, it says tells you no, it's this. And I think it's brilliant. And there was yeah. a uh, when uh, the uh, somebody interviewed uh, David Chase, the guy who the creator of The Sopranos, and you yes. know, base the there the was you, media empire, which has uh, I believe The Verge and and a few other great. Very very well written blogs, but but their mothership Vox had the uh, the infamous uh, David Chase Sopranos post that that got them into a fight with Saved You a Click. Yeah, and it turned out that that uh, so Saved You a Click spoiled what the article said, but then David and then got criticized too by other journalists who were frustrated by the idea that Saved You a Click could just destroy this link baby headline sort of technique. And then it turned out too that David Chase was upset with Vox. Says no, that's not what I meant. You know, they made. Took it out of context. You guys weren't even right. Yeah, okay, yeah. at the end of it. Yeah, but, but yeah, I, it was basically the headline was like, "Did Tony die at the end of The Sopranos?" Question mark and uh, like the answer. I, I forget which even way it came down, but I think it was yes. And so like, saved you a click was like, no, yes. no. The answer was no. They, they was, said no. Vox said no. Okay, so yeah, yeah, but whatever. It was it was a definitive thing, and then it was like even the the, the article was dumb. But uh, I, I believe it was. Nilay Patel, uh, who like lit into saved you a click about, you know, that they're ruining uh, journalism. Yes. <laughs> journalism. I don't, Legit, legitimate cl- clickbait journalism is being exactly. ruined. Exactly. Whatever happened to the good old days? We used to be able to get 20 page clicks out of one question. Now saved you a click is ruining it for us all. Yeah, I don't know. And it's like it's like oh well, the people work so hard on this, and this was a legitimate scoop, and now you're like uh, demotivating people to click on the headline. But it's I don't know, really. I, and it's 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 silly. And like and 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 I'm gonna bring this. Trust me, I'm gonna bring this back to Ebola in a moment. You know, right now there's there's supposed to be mega Star Wars spoilers out there, and I don't know what they are. I'm not gonna go seek them out, but I will say this: my position about spoilers. Could you imagine if? We knew the plot line of Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, Game of the Thrones, Godfather, or Jaws, or any of those things before the movie came out, or, or Game of Thrones, or, or uh, oh yeah, <laughs> or The Walking Dead, or uh, and, yeah. Well, yeah, well, obviously. that's 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 the whole thing. Um, uh, that's that's my theory about the changing shape of magic. You know, the, there's been the ebb and, ebb and flow. Where it's like, you know, the old guard at any given time feels like magic's now ruined because some new medium contains more information about magic. You know, whether it's uh, in the 1920s, ah, now Camel Cigarettes has a pamphlet uh, explaining how to do some magic tricks. Oh, Camel, you've ruined magic. And then, uh, you know, in the 1990s, it's, uh, um, you know, uh, well, the, the exposure shows really did take a dump on magic. But, uh, you know, it's certainly now in, in – we now live in an age where pretty much no matter what the trick – People have the answer in their pocket at the exact moment that you do the trick for them. But the moment it's, it's over, they can't be bothered to reach all the way into their pocket and type in a go. Oh, God, yeah. I just put a bullet in my head. Just tell me if it was a string or not, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and I think that I, I prefer to live in a spoil-free environment as I can. And I think that the, our, our job is to sort of maintain that. But, you know, we certainly live in an environment where, you know, there's we, we feed on the sensationalism, et cetera, on that. Um, 
looking at what news did, look at that CNN headline. I go to CNN. I'm going to still go to CNN every day. Let me make that clear. But look at the CNN headline of is it time to panic? And you look at all the media talk about everything. I, you know, it's it's a game for them. It's a headlines. It's a it's a story. It's a story to talk about, you know, until you're an NBC cameraman who just contracted it on his way when he went to Africa to go investigate it. You know, that's when it gets real. And that's the thing is like we, we talked about these things before, like when will I believe other people are serious? It's when they act like they're serious. You know, if, you know, somebody is decrying the use of fossil fuels yet is flying to environmental summits in their own private jet. <laughs> you know, I'm like whoever that fo- former vice president may be. We're not no, going to name talk- names. No, I'm not even not even talking about him. Um, uh, He's talking know, but- about a son of a senator who was once a presidential candidate. <laughs> no, I, I'm every celebrity is pretty much I can I can start naming them. You know that it's this you know photo ops in the front lines, and then next thing you know they're on like the fifth largest private yacht in the world. <laughs> it's like, all right, you're not living this. So and that comes to a lot of things, and so Ebola, other stuff like that. Is it like you know it's like this, this is a real thing, and we need to do precautions, and you know we need to be very very careful about that. And we've been covering the delightful antics of the CDC on this show of missing samples and things like that. And uh, it reminds me of uh, 22 Jump Street. You know, there's a scene where they're a chase scene on the college campus and all of a sudden the Benny Hill music passes and they pass like the Benny, the Benny Hill, you know, center for visual arts or something like that. <laughs> That's amazing. The yakety sax. Yeah, da, 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 da. yeah, exactly. That's the acting sex. So anyhow, uh, that's the thing we have to look at everything through the light of is that, is that uh, you know, the, the, the media, you have reporters who are kind of ignorant covering this stuff, who are not scientifically literate as they pretend to be. You have people who are, who, who love science, love the mantle of science, who love, love science as a concept and a word and want to put it on t-shirts and things like that who don't grasp the process and who, you know, want to treat it as some other institution to worship and not a process or a methodology. And so it convolutes things. So I just saying that, you know, we need to just chill out, chill out, evaluate the, holy crap, man thought to have died from Ebola awakens after burial team wraps him up. Wait, tell me that's real. That's real. Wait, it is? That's real. It's happened. They've had at least a couple of people who've, uh, they thought were dead from Ebola who've come back from the dead. (laughs) Wait, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the United States, not in the United States. Well, no, we haven't had okay. enough victims here, Brian. Okay, all right, all right, enough. Oh, I see. Head news flash alerts. Andrew yeah, says Brian. we haven't had enough victims in the U.S. Not to nobody I know here, Brian. I just think are, this is where the thing started autoplay. So in light of all that, there have been a couple headlines where they've had people. Again, these are, these are places like Liberia, which, wonderful country except for everything wrong with it. Um, <laughs> Uh, actually, my dad was like in Liberia, like in the seventies or something like that. So it was any place back then. But anyhow, so their their medical school and training, you know, they have like many of these countries have produced fantastic doctors and medical pet professionals who are working in other countries now. And here, so uh, there is a long history of how you diagnose somebody as dead, and it's not as clear cut as you would think it would be. And in some third world cultures, it's like eh, I, don't, I don't think they're breathing. Well, eh, they're dead. Well, that yeah. was that was the big uh, like uh, a call problem, you know that that you uh, you really need to go through your depth chart a little deeper on this. Is our you know is this person dead thing? So well, let me read this to you. All right, go ahead. Uh, amid the deadliest Ebola outbreak in history, it's easier to get help if you are dead than if you are alive. This is from ABC. My producer and I were driving back from an assignment on Rovia where we filmed this morning's Good Morning, Good Morning America segment when we saw a burial team working along the roadway surrounded by crowds of angry locals. A community leader said they'd been trying to get help for the dead man for days, but no ambulance ever came. When the man died, a burial team came in an hour. We watched as the burial team suited up and approached the body lying against a wall. They sprayed it down to the bleach and moved it to a black plastic sheet and began to wrap it up. We couldn't get him help when he was alive, a community leader told me. They only come when you die. Just then, the man moved his arm, just a little, but clearly a sign of life. He's alive, someone yelled. The burial team unwrapped him and put him back on the ground. The man was alive, but looked like he would only last a few more hours. About 10 minutes later, an ambulance pulled up, and a separate team of health workers loaded him into the back. The crowd went wild cheering. Uh, I'm not dead. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, 
there was another instance, I think, of a woman at a funeral. But here, here, here's a. Uh, you can see the photos there. This guy who's on the ground. There's this crowd's backed up, and next thing you know, he moves. And he's alive. I don't remember that in Walking Dead. <laughs> I don't remember World War Z. We're cheering well, the first okay, well, one. And, well, and, and, you know, <laughs> and no, he's not a zombie. He's a human being. I know that. I'm kidding. And it's well, just, it, it, no, 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 but 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 here's my, here's the part of that whole story that concerned me the most. We're like, well, he was alive, but he really only had a few hours, and and, and so it's like, well, he was kind of set up lawn chairs and hang around. And we're like, well, let's just let's just wait this one to wind itself down. Like, did, yeah. they didn't end up saving the guy, did they? I don't know what they did. Uh, I don't know. And now he's the president of the United States of America. <laughs> So there's another another instance of a uh, that was zombie president. I saw that movie. <laughs> so there's another case, and again, I guess this is Liberia, where two women in their forties, uh, one in her forties, the other in her sixties, suddenly spring up from caskets, striking panic. Um, so apparently, this has been happening a couple times, and I think it's just because it's like when you get these diseases, and all of a sudden you're body signs get to be so low or non-existent. Well, but well, well, and also, I mean, this was the big craze in the 1800s, right? Was people would have, they'd pay extra money to make sure that when they were buried, it was in a coffin that had a special handle so you could ring a bell, say, mm -hmm. shouting from six feet under, like, not dead, not dead, not dead. And I guess this all started because, like, they exhumed some bodies where it's like there's just claw marks at, at the top of the coffin because somebody woke up because they weren't quite so dead. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's the stories that sort of vampires and other legends would stem from when they would do exhumations and they would find the interior coffins that were damaged like that and you either had two explanations. Your town doctor was a complete quack who couldn't spot the living from the dead or they came back to life from some sort of process. And, you know, what are you going to do? Like, they're like, you're the most education, per educated person in town. Like, Doc, what happens? He's like, I don't, I don't know. Gypsy curse. <laughs> God, God blame goblins. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So that's when you event. just have to take that long pause, look out the window and say, they're back. <laughs> you put on your sunglasses. That's it. What, Doc? Never mind. We've got work to do. <laughs> so there's, uh, in the long run, um, the uh, the uh, uh, patron saint of weird things. One of them is is Matt Ridley, and he's my canary. Whenever Matt Lid Ridley worries about something, then I decide I should worry or not. Um, and so, going through the sober Matt Ridley's Rational Optimist blog, I come across the epidemic is not under control. <laughs> Reasons to be fearful about Ebola. <laughs> so really. So, uh, and, and he's, he's basically getting into just kind of the issues. The problem is, is that you, you have uh, the, the ability for these places. He's not really, he's not worried for America or Britain or Europe. He's worried about in those countries. And that's a thing we have to think about is that we tend to think about, oh, what happens here? And, and there's a reason why we're sending troops and we're sending people over there. You know, it's not just to keep it from coming back from here. It's to prevent a humongous humanitarian disaster in those countries, in those places that are ill-equipped to be able to treat the people for this disease. And sometimes the simplest precautions can make all the difference in the world. And that's a thing to be mindful of. The headlines is that our 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 chances of being hurt from this are, you know, we're greater chance of getting struck by lightning right now. Yeah. But there are people right now in Africa living with this nightmare, who are living with this thing. And it is not a joke there. Well, it like, is not. Keep, keep in mind also, like, uh, as much as we bemoan, like, oh, everyone stays in their house and watches their TVs and nobody sees each other. And it's like, uh, yeah, bro, that's why we don't have to really fear Ebola, because we don't have to leave the house. <laughs> Brian, this is the first. So I was, I was just in Singapore and then New York. And I decided every other trip, I always came back and I got something. I always got some sort of bacterial thing or something like that and was sick for a few days. It was without fail, every time I went on a trip, I would catch something because I'm in an airplane for a long time, you're around. And, and I think the, you know, the worst place in the world is like the airplane bathrooms. And the problem is the way the airplane bathrooms are designed is you go there, you go wash your hands, and then you got to open that door. Yeah. 
And and door handles are made of nickel or brass or whatever, generally speaking, because you know the bacteria won't live on them very long. But in an airport airplane bathroom, you're going to get a bunch of people there. Chances are most of them did not efficiently wash their hands, mm -hmm. and you know, and sometimes you just put water on it with all that. If you just just rinse it really quickly with water, all you're really doing is making everything on your hands come off more loosely on the next surface you touch. Little hint. Wow. So, you know, wash your hands. Wash your hands thoroughly. And like I hate it. You go into the bathroom, you see somebody who just uses the jaw and just walk straight out into a restaurant. And I'm I want to start a shaming sort of thing and just like go up to the table, like, hey guys, uh, everything all right? Um, no, I don't work here. So when I tell you this guy who's reaching into the bread bowl right now, yeah, I didn't wash his hands in the bathroom. Just letting you know. Bye. <laughs> yeah, that was a uh, uh, in fact, there was a Freakonomics story about this, how they actually uh, they, they started monitoring in many hospitals, doctors, uh, whether or not they're washing their hands. And then they just sort of quietly monitored, quietly monitored. And they put up signs like, please wash your hands or whatever. And so finally, um, they they hit this point where they had an all hands meeting and they're like, the following doctors were seen not washing their hands. Oh, oh wow. Dr. Andrew Maine, Dr. Justin Robert not Young. True, not so, true. Not <laughs> true. But but then like uh, like apparently like it just sent freaking shockwaves through the hospital. They're like, "Did you hear?" And so then it was all of a sudden it was just like everybody was washing their hands and and the actual disease like they didn't monitor how well it worked by how many hands were watch washed. They were able to monitor from the actual reduction in contamination that they saw afterwards. And that's that these things, these things are real and legitimate. And so it's like that's the 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 thorough wash is not just to loosen everything on your hands and et cetera. But anyhow, it, it that's a real thing. But you know, I mean these last two trips, I made it a point where I constantly used Perel on my hands. Mm -hmm. Constantly. Wash my hands thoroughly, then when I couldn't do that, every time I shook hands or whatever, because I was going like in Singapore. I was going from like sweet to sweet, interacting people, shaking hands, taking photographs, whatever. So I made it a point, like every five minutes or whatever, Perel on the hands, and not just so I didn't catch whatever they caught, so I didn't spread whatever I had to other people around there. And so I did that in Singapore, and then I did that when I was in New York, and I'm three days back, so far nothing. So maybe, maybe I dodged a bullet this time, but... You know what's um, funny is the weird social stigma there is about like, if you were to, if you were to shake hands with someone and then immediately wipe it off, that that person would be offended, like uh, at some core level, not not even, not even for any rational reason. I'm sure they would understand, but it's like I, I have a socially acceptable way to handle that. What, what do, do tell? I use Perel before I shake their hands. Okay. So they see me da, 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 and like, hey, how are you doing? You know. So then they understand that it's 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 about me, not them, kind of thing. And then I'll use it afterwards. I try to use it covertly, but I'll if I'll do it before I shake hands with somebody like that. So then they realize, oh, that's you know, kind. I it's, guess. Well, anyway. it's, it, well, and it's like, uh, oh, he's getting rid of the other guy's germs, exactly, and you know, because exactly. he's taking care of me. And so, any event, you know, this 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 crisis is real. It's real in Africa. It's a real situation there, and and among the other situations they have to do from. Bad water, et cetera, things like that. And it's, it, and I'm going to reinforce who I think one of the greatest human beings of the 21st century is Bill Gates. And, oh, sure. You know, he was a guy that in the 1990s was a ruthless business guy. You watch his testimony in the Microsoft trial, which I don't think they should have had to go to trial for, but he just came across as sort of this arrogant, terse kind of guy. And to see him evolve into this extremely compassionate person that is dedicating his fortune towards and has saved millions of lives is amazing, is absolutely, absolutely amazing. He's not a guy that shows he's donated some stuff to some university stuff, but he's not a guy that was trying to build big institutions and art museums to himself. You know, every time you see a living senator get a highway named for them or whatever, it makes me cringe. It just makes me cringe, you know, when, when politicians and stuff, you know, seek out these things. Here you have a guy that considers the best thing he can possibly do is if he can just save one life and he's helped save millions of lives by, you know, taking, you know, he uh, a certain confluence of events helped him achieve what he's done. And now he's taking it back to, you know, the mother continent and trying to help people there who certain confluence of events aren't as fortunate you know but well and there uh to me the impressive thing is the the ripple effect of not only did he do that extraordinary you know commitment of his financial empire to to the stated goal of you know doing the most good by the numbers of, of where we needed the most but he made it fashionable for other bil billionaires to do the exact same thing and there's this really good section in uh the book abundance where they talk about how 
you know, the new economy uh, rich uh, are, tend to be young and they already have all the toys they want and they want now they're now they're all hunting a legacy and they all want to out legacy each other by doing mm -hmm. the greater good for humanity, which is utterly wonderful. Yeah, they're they're doing sort of a smart thing that previously it was just, oh, I'll just leave it all to charity. Well, let me tell you what, the charity world's not all it's cracked up to be. Charity world is often not very efficient. They have weird metrics. There are some fantastic charities out there. What Bill Gates did is he approached it with a scientific looking you know, perspective and said, let's see what's effective. Let's see what's not. Let's the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation evaluates how things work. They try to get maximum results for their efforts and they're constantly evaluating. It's not just, oh, we're going to write checks because that'll solve the problems. I mean, the charitable contributions to this country far eclipse any other country in the planet by per capita historically, et cetera, whatever, and some of it gets put to great use and some of it gets put to use of trying to just to secure more funds for the, the nature of charities work. Now you're getting this next generation, as you pointed out, who are saying, you know, the, the most humanitarian thing that, that, that Elon Musk could do right now is make money with SpaceX by creating this viable company that can exist 20 years from now, 30 years from now, and employ the best and brightest and incur, encourage this environment. That is what he should be doing. You know, is that is it by unleashing the D? <laughs> yeah, dude. unleashing the D. Everybody wants the D. <laughs> we'll talk about the D in just okay. a second. So we'll get to the D in just a second. But anyhow, but yeah, that's what I like now is I think that you can you saving the world or doing something you know helpful for other people could be you know could be something as simple as you know what let's create a game like Minecraft. Let's create Minecraft. You know, let's create a way for for kids to build things and to see how engineering works and do that. Minecraft's a wonderful thing. You know, Minecraft's this beautiful game that's different from what we had before, but it's Legos, it's this and it's that. And things like that, I think, can, can change the world. So you can do a lot of good things differently, not just by saying, oh, I'm going to dedicate my life. I had a conversation with a billionaire once, and I asked him for some advice because like, hey, things worked out for him. And he said, he said listen, he said, my th I think that like, if you want to involve in charitable wax or do, do good things, he said, be successful first. Well, you know, yeah. If you're if you're poor and you're working doing charitable stuff or things like that, you're only going to be you know limited to what you can do as one person. If you're successful, you're financially successful, et cetera, you can do a lot more. I'm like, oh, interesting point. Well, yeah, I guess it makes sense because what you're doing is you're you're you are uh, building a bigger engine that can drive more anything. You're you're diverting resources from let's say the selfish who want iPhones and and you are converting those resources into, you're, you're tricking them into charity by, by throwing their profits at a problem. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and even, but even an example like iPhones, you think about where the electronics manufacturing takes a certain level of skill set. It takes a higher level of skill set than is involved in textiles or just vacuum form molding or other things like that. You can't build an iPhone in Burma. You know, you can't build an iPhone in Laos. You can't build an iPhone in a lot of places. May borderline some parts of, you know, maybe some ish parts of it could be made in Vietnam. But a lot of that kind of manufacturing that was done in China, those people have been priced out of the market. Is that it's below their skill set. So that's why those things, those other things they used to make in China are being made in Vietnam or being made in Burma or being made in parts of India, et cetera. Because... That just the idea of creating this technological product that requires a higher skill set brings people up. How long? How long until uh, uh, I don't know Laos or Nigeria is the new uh, place f for for, the, for that kind of thing? Is 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 the is the corruption there? I assume at some point it's breakable, but I mean we've seen you know what fifty hundred year cycle of of corrupt uh, of officials making it an unattractive place to bring that kind of uh, manufacturing business. You know, it's it's interesting. It's hard because it's 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 you have sometimes corruption fills a vacuum and fills solves certain problems. And you know, we've talked about before the the the, uh, the wonderful story about how Henry Ford would play his, pay his employees five bucks a day. The reason he paid his employees five bucks a day, and almost nobody ever got that. In order to get a five dollar a day payment, you had to be married. Your wife couldn't work. You had to let his his socialist uh, group, literally it was the socialist worker, socialist American authority group or whatever, go into your home and make sure that you're an upstanding citizen, that you didn't drink or gambling like that to get the full thing. But the reason he did pay high rates was because the turnover was really, really ridiculously high because it was dangerous working in those factories. And they would have, for like 37,000 positions, they would hire 150,000 people a year. And that many people would quit or leave or whatever. And it was a way to try to retain. 
And that's a problem that we had. So this was 100 years ago in, our, in, our, in America. So you'd have people like, eh, I don't want to work here. Eh, I don't want to do there. Fortunately, the profit margins were high enough that he could sort of do that theory, and theoretically for a while. And these other countries, you sort of have that problem where – you know, you come from a rural area, you go work in the factory and you deal with the difficulties there and you're like, eh, I don't know. Getting getting the skilled workers is a problem. And in those countries in particular, if you are educated, you go to the universities there and you get educated, you don't stick around. You take Burma. You know, Burma used to be kind of like a, a high point of Southeast Asia in like the 1950s, had the fanciest airport, whatever. And now all the really educated Burmese want to leave because of the military regime that runs the place. So it's hard. I don't yeah. know what the answer is. Can we talk about the D? All right. Let's talk about the D. So Mr. Elon Musk today made two announcements. And I'm going to say that I think one announcement that he made may perhaps have been misinterpreted by the press. Because he said that next year we'll have a Tesla that's like 90% automated. Okay. He said they'll have a Tesla car that can 90% of the time drive itself. And people are like, what? What model is this coming to? I read that as... They'll have a Tesla, a singular test Tesla, to show that it's 90% you know, automated, not that they're going to have an entire line that he's going to release an automated car next year. All right. Now, when you say automated, is that self-driving? Is there a particular— Yeah, 90% um, self-driving. What should I be looking for if I wanted to see what news story this was? Because um, uh, I'm getting a bunch of stuff from days ago. Let's try uh, Musk self-driving. Bloomberg has a— uh, Yeah, all right. Musk self-driving. Um, so, uh, wow. Um, yeah, man. So apparently it was an interview to CNN Money. Uh, the quote was, a Tesla car next year will probably be 90% capable of autopilot. Well, even if, uh, even if we just had uh, automated highway driving, what a, what a coup that would be, mm -hmm. man. You know, the fact that, just think of how many... Highway fat I mean, fatalities don't happen at 35 miles an hour nearly as often as they do at 75 miles an hour. Yeah, I, and but I, I again, I, I'm hopeful, but I, I think I, I hope that next year he's announced they actually have a production vehicle that's that way. But I, I is I mean, it says you know, it says I mean, this is T3, whoever they are. But uh, uh, but my guess is all the blogs are. Uh, hey, it turns out blogs sometimes uh, misinterpret statements. Andrew, did you know that? I've heard that. Yeah, I, it was because his actual quote was a, a Tesla, Tesla car. car. Yeah. Yeah. So, again, I hope to be wrong. I hope that it actually is, you know, fully. But I think that I've, everybody's <laughs> ran with it. Sorry, guys. Hold on. I have an actual <laughs> clip here. Let me just get through the, uh, the ad. Uh, man, uh, how, how much – I mean, I guess uh, – in California, they're pretty much like 100% like it's all just legal to have self-driving cars and you can, if you own one, you can use it now or what? Well, yeah, but the, they're, they're doing tests. Like I forget like the provision. Here's the problem with self-driving cars. Again, I'm a big fan. The problem with self-driving cars is we think about the ideal situations, but now think about situations where the police are routing traffic around an intersection to a different section and they have cones and you have three people standing, three cops standing there, one of them directing traffic. Yeah, um, you know, uh, I got to feel like that's a 20-minute problem uh, because um, that's the kind of thing where it's like if the cops are the one rerouting it, then what they do is they, they say, everybody stop for 30 seconds. Let me update the police traffic app. Boom. And then all the cr cars right. just turn and go have around. You ever seen a, have you ever seen the computers inside of a police car? Uh, yes. Uh, look, I mean, yes. No, uh, again, again, I'm saying, uh, yes, I agree. If we, if we were to try to solve this problem from a municipal level, that would be the solution. And if we're going to try it through a municipal level, triple the time frame. This is a problem that's going to be best be solved by Google and you know Musk and all them figuring out how to have a, have a more intelligent AI that sits in there and says there. And because you're going to have those edge problems, you're going to always have those edge problems that that are going to be problematic. And, and hoping that every every city in the country is going to know to do that, or when you have you know a car broken down in the middle of the road. I mean, a car be a well, well, I guess it, I guess what I'm saying is is along with the release of the automated self-driving cars in mass will come 
the uh, you know, and in partnership with local municipalities, we're going to work with them, and they just give us a call, and we'll route around their traffic problems and so on. Uh, did you guys want to hear the Elon Musk? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, just one second, Brian. Look at the state of the new communication system we tried to implement after nine eleven. Uh, these things just don't work. I mean, at that level, I mean, if you're if you're advocating that, that the cities and the local governments will help us, we need to talk about your politics. No, no, no. Okay, what, what I'm saying, I'm not saying they solve it for us. I'm saying they use it. I'm not saying they build it. I'm saying they 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 announce, and then they they're like, we are announcing, we're fixing these lights, and then you know, uh, uh, and then. No, nope, Brian, you're saying that the sweet arms of mother government <laughs> will solve all of our problems. Are these things really going to be a reality? Autonomous cars will definitely be a reality. A Tesla car next year will probably be. 90% capable of autopilot. Like, so 90% of your miles could be on auto. You know, for sure, highway uh, travel. How is that going to happen? Uh, with a combination of various sensors, um, you, you combine um, cameras with image recognition, with radar and long range ultrasonics. That'll do it. Other car companies will follow. But you guys are going to be the leader. Of course. I mean, it says a Silicon Valley company. I mean, if we're not the leader, then we're, we're shame on us. All right. All right. Man, that really does sound like it's coming next year. But then I remember that next year is three months away. And that suddenly sounds really hard to believe. Yeah. Uh, um, this sounds very much uh, like... I mean, Elon Musk is obviously a hero. Talking about patron saints of this podcast, he is probably, you know, first among equals. Uh, but he is certainly prone to waxing philosophical uh, about about the future. And, and you know, very oftentimes it is backed up, which is why we love him. But uh, I, I, I think I, I more agree with, with Andrew that this is probably something that we will see demonstrations of and get a more... Uh, realistic timetable that is something that's not 2015 on when we would be able to do it, you know, or I mean, when it would be sold. I mean, it would take like the ability to launch a 10 story tall rocket from one place up high up thousands of feet in the air and land with pinpoint accuracy back on the earth to be able to make. Well, I'll tell you, I, that's a that's a pretty good uh, demonstration of the tech. If you're like, listen, we can take a <laughs> building and launch it. I'm pretty sure we can handle driving you to school. Uh, yeah, mind I, you, this interview was uh, but like it, it was done in uh, SpaceX, which would looked like their Hawthorne, uh, their 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 Hawthorne uh, center there. So they had like a Dragon capsule literally behind him. So when he says we're gonna do a self driving car, I don't know. Like yeah. shrug. We're a way to say no. I I think they have. I just as far as will it be a production? I would love for it to be a production. Yeah. I would love for it. But I just think that the quote he said was a Tesla car, which could mean a model, could mean this, but it could just mean. Singular, you know, we'll have a demonstration one. Don't know, but we do know. I so mean, he, he, uh, Justin, why don't you take the lead on this one? Ah, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the D, the D. Uh, Elon Musk goes on Twitter this week. He says, uh, I got a big announcement, and then uh, has a, I believe it's just a, a picture with a tweet that let me get, let me get it exactly. Exactly correct. Um, <laughs> uh, oh man! About time oh, to unveil the D and something yes, else. There you go, <laughs> Elon Musk. About time to unveil the D and something else. So he's got a, a picture of of a garage. What looks like a a bit of an urban setting. The door is uh, with with D on it is opening, and you can see the distinctive headlights of a Tesla with the Tesla logo inside of it, but the car itself is shrouded in darkness, saying October 9th, 2014, uh, is when we will hear more about it. Um, this was then met with uh, much hilarity and fanfare as, you know, the phrase, you know, she wants the D or, you know, get the D or want, you know, is is commonplace for the male anatomy. He tweets later, uh, I love the Internet. Comments had me literally R.O.F.L. No, it wasn't intentional. Glad I didn't mention the other letter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so so does that mean uh, is it going to be a well, wait, mention, wait, what's the other letter? Is I it, know. I'm going, what is the other letter? Was, uh, was he going to do a Model V or a Model A? <laughs> 
I mean, what if what if it was the driverless vehicle? It was yeah, the, the the DV. <laughs> uh, the the what? Oh, the DV. <laughs> or maybe it's 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 a, a pilot, so it's piloted, so it could be the DP. <laughs> Oh, uh, that's funny because DP is director of photography. Uh, that's that's some television humor you just made. Very good. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad to throw that in. Uh, yeah. So the the rumor is the D is going to be dual. The idea that basically, if you've ever seen, if you ever get a chance to go into a Tesla store in Peru and see, they'll have like they'll show you just the chassis the Tesla is built upon. Um, they'll yell at you to get out of it and they'll tell you to stop putting your fingerprints over it and then they'll ask, why are you crying, Mr. Maine? No, you have to go. We don't care. We don't watch your stupid show or read your books. Just leave. Yeah, it's too bad that your apartment doesn't have an electrical outlet for you to recharge one of these anyways. Just um, Anyhow, aside from that, if you look at the chassis, you'll see, when you see the motor, it's like first game you play, like I'll bring friends, I'll go like, all right, where's the motor? Where's the motor? Because the electric motor is not this big, huge V8 size thing. I mean, it's 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 big, but it's not super big compared to everything else. You can almost just look right past it and not realize where the motor is. So, the rumor is the D might be dual that they might have two motors in there, and this might be a basically a supercar Tesla. So basically, uh, uh, much much obviously, uh, uh, kind of like having two processors gives you more better processor power if you're splitting up the work of. Hard acceleration and so on. Having two engines or motors would would help. Absolutely, and and you could two motors would mean this thing could really. I mean, Tesla Tesla by themselves already these things can go neck and neck with Porsche. So Tesla with two motors in it, the acceleration that thing could have. He could be building something that could go battle the McLaren drag That's racing. Cool. Yeah. And, you know, the Tesla, like everywhere out in L.A., Tesla is the car to have. You see Teslas everywhere. And there's this discussion of what happens when Tesla comes out with, you know, a consumer model, you know, the $40,000 version, and then they have the $100,000 version. I think that it becomes, I think that they, they kind of do what Mercedes does without getting into the, the, the too low end that doesn't really represent their Mercedes brand all the way, but then have, you know, at the higher end, they could have, you know, remember they started with a Tesla Roadster. It all started with a little little cool. Yeah, I'll that- tell you what. Uh, what I hope they do is I hope they launch a new brand uh, uh, under the Tesla umbrella, but a different brand because Tesla right now means exclusive, high end, and everybody wants one. And once they become, you know, thirty thousand dollar, highly efficient little uh, stuff that that everyone could have, it it I think it would undercut their brand position uh, and make it I- less less elitist. I disagree. I disagree 100. percent I think that when you're just trying to create a different brand, that's just a shell game. I think of like the Apple model, where it's like we're going to do the best product we can do. They're all going to be Apple. No, and- see, see, the uh, um, uh, when they when Lexus was launched, they originally uh, ran surveys saying which would you rather buy, a brand called Lexus or Toyota Supreme. And everybody said Toyota Supreme. I like so pro- Toyota, Toyota, and Supreme is just a better version of Toyota. And then they, but they went against what everyone said they wanted, and they went with Lexus. They launched a brand new brand. Most people who buy Lexuses don't even know they're buying a Toyota, and they would be a little bit sadder when they find out that they. I were. don't think anybody buying a Lexus doesn't know that's built by Toyota, but. Uh, oh, do I disagree? I, I mean, it's uh, I, I. I uh, uh, point is, well, that's, I mean, and that's and that's that's great, and it's particularly in a car industry where you have middle you have middling ranges of quality, where you don't you know with the low end you're going to get really really low end, and it's middle thing. I think that the goal, I respect brands that say no, we're going to put our name on it. We'll put our name on it because we think that if you, you know, a the cheapest iPad is a wonderful device. The cheapest iPad doesn't feel like a cheap device. Yeah, but you see, we, we've seen this not work for brands like Oldsmobile and Cadillac. We've seen those. Brands Brands tarnished because Cadillac started. It's like it's like who wants a twenty dollar Rolex? Rolex means one thing, and that's but, why but yeah, everybody if it's wants a twenty dollar Rolex. Is a cheap Rolex? Yeah, then well, nobody wants it. That's the problem. Is when they get into the lower market and they put out crappy products. No, uh, well, again, it's uh, 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 
the reason people, uh, it, 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 you call it brand extension, where it's like you're sitting on a gold mine because you've spent so much time and effort to build a certain brand, and the hard thing to do is to build a new brand. But if this product means something different, when I say Tesla, you think of very specific things. You think of power. But you just, that's what it means to you, though. That's not, again, that's, 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 that's what's interesting, because that's how you describe it. I think of it as the best electrical vehicles in the world. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, well, I you, guess we'll, you described we'll Mercedes, BMW, you described you know, a number of, of cars that all could have been fit by that description depending on your point of view. That's correct. I think if you, if you see yourself as a technological leader, then you say, no, our technology means this. This is I mean, what again, our technology means. We've seen, we've seen brands collapse under that, the, uh, under that thinking. Um, what technology brands that have maintained the quality of collapse? We're not again, talking about technology brand. We're talking about the car brand. I'm using car examples because this is a car and we're talking about the car market. But I'm saying that when you consider yourself as must as a technology company, as a Silicon I mean, Valley he company, can, he can consider himself whatever he wants. He can, he can call consider himself a wants. six foot chicken. Uh, but, but, but the most but successful company, the, the most successful company in the world is Apple. Most successful product company, merchandising company in the world is Apple. In the history of the planet, most successful. They have one brand. They brought that brand together, and they said, you know, we're not going to come up with some spin-off thing and some cheaper version of it just because the market. We're going to put Apple on every single product we do because we're standby. We don't need a separate thing. They'll come out with versions. There's going to be Apple Watch. There's going to be Apple Sport Watch. There'll be Apple Edition, which is going to be the gold-plated version, whatever. Still Apple. Still the Apple logo. Right, but again, they they've never catered to, or they don't cater to the low end on anything across the board. They don't create, they don't cater to the low end. Well, you'd say the low. What is again? They didn't make they didn't make netbooks because they said they couldn't make a profit, but they have you know three hundred dollar iPads. Uh, yeah, which is uh, three times the cost of uh, of a low end uh, uh, Android. I mean, I think you're really. Um, I think I think the more that you confuse a car company for a technology company, the harder you're going to have a hard, uh, uh, the harder a time you're going to uh, uh, be able to speak to the market. I, I'm going to say fundamentally, the car market is a different market than the technology market. I think that 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 people value brands differently in the car market, and I think we've seen success and failure stories. We've seen brands crumble by offering lower end. Uh, essentially stripped down versions of other cars and, and you that's say, not what they're trying to do again that's the point is you keep you keep you keep and again they've been the most successful american car company in 40 years because they perceive themselves as a technology company you know they've said we're going to do things differently yes they're in the car and apple everybody said apple was wrong not to do a netbook everybody said apple should have done this or should have done that apple said we're going to do our own thing it's going to be apple we're going to go through we're going to streamline we're not going to put in low end but if we can get a product at this lower price point and have quality we will do that and they did that that's why Apple has the lion's share of profits in all these different markets is because they don't do cheaper versions. They do less expensive versions, and there's a fundamental difference between that. Less expensive doesn't have to mean cheap, and that's been their attitude. Tesla following that model. Maybe they will. I have no idea if they're going to say we're going to put in a game, but I think that once you say, like, oh, here's this other thing because we just want to cater to people who are buying only an emblem on a shirt or only this and don't care about quality, that's a fleeting market. They're not buying quality. Uh, yeah, but I mean, I guess the whole thing that started this whole discussion is that you said that in Los Angeles, Tesla is the car to have. And think of yeah. everyone who owns a Tesla right now. Once that Tesla costs $20,000 and every college kid has it, uh, do you really think that they're going to be uh, th that excited to have a, t a Tesla? I think that if it's the best, if it's the best car, I think yes. I, I think of the world of cars as status I symbols. Failed the D hey. on their brand new date. And it's like a hundred thousand dollars, and it goes faster than everything, and and it's in a Michael Bay movie, like. Well, I mean, what would be the downside, you know, uh, uh, to to producing a Scion kind of line? Because uh, Scion was a brand new line created by, uh, I believe, it was Toyota again, right? Uh, yep. They they yeah. created they they have done a very smart job of splitting into different brands. Toyotas are what middle class uh, uh, people are able to afford. They're solid and reliable. Scion is what you uh, buy when you're fresh out of high school and in college. And on the high end, once you have the money, you buy a Lexus. What's wrong with three different brands? Why wouldn't I they do that? Again, I, I drive a Scion. I like my Scion, but actually Scion hasn't been that successful in the last couple of years. They're having issues as far as the subsidiary. The brand thing, you can, you can, it's a matter of choice. And you say, okay, how do these people perceive themselves? And you look at when people said, you know what, we're not going to create another name just because we're trying to appeal. We're just trying to, we're trying to slap a label on something and say, no, this is high end or this is this. You can either say, I want the quality to speak for itself, and I want to that's what people to buy on quality, or you can say, I'm going to try to sell it purely on marketing. 
Apple gets accused of being a marketing company, but the thing is, is the consistency, you pick up their cheapest product and it is very, very well made and extremely well made, much better made yeah, than no, their I, I mean, I, I, I get you. And I just think it's a, it's a very optimistic view because essentially what you're saying is build the quality and the sales will follow. And um, uh, that that doesn't seem to be the way the world works. I mean, uh, uh, Apple is worked extremely So Apple's hard. a failure? No. Tesla's a failure? Uh, yeah, These were two companies. These are the two well, biggest well, buddy, companies in my hey, stock portfoil, and, and, and I bought them because of that Apple. no need to get all riled up. I'm just saying that the reason, a uh, big part of the reason that they're successful is because they have done an exquisite job of crafting their brands. And I think that I think that it's a mistake for you to say, no, branding doesn't mean anything. It's just lies it's that you sell cars with. Meaning. Not all, Brian. Um, I think that I'm, my point is, is that when you, when you, which value to put higher, Samsung spends twice as much on advertising as Apple does. But when you look at the percentage of profit made in the market, Apple still gets the higher percentage. Well, yes, again, um, it's, it's not, I'm not let me talking ask you about this. advertising. Let me, just, let me, let me try to advance the, 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 the conversation one step. Uh, Brian, is Tesla enough of a black swan, like amongst the car companies, that it would not be beneficial to sacrifice the fact that they are looked at as a total game changer in a way that, you know, I rent cars every week and sometimes I'm in a Honda and sometimes I'm in a Toyota and sometimes I'm in a Ford and I can't tell the difference, you know from any of them, you know, just getting down in the car and sitting in it. That would not necessarily, that would not be the same if I sat in, in, a, in a Tesla, not only for performance, but also for the fact that it's a, a, an electric car that you can use these superchargers. The experience would be fundamentally different. So is, is tes does Tesla not have to play by those car branding rules because it is not just another widget, it's a different experience uh i uh first of all it doesn't matter what i think it's not like we could vote it one way or the other i will say that the in the history of cars uh it would be an extraordinary exception to the 100 year history of the marketing of cars and i i am one to bet on the facts and the pre previous history which says that you in the short term will always make a lot of money by extending your line but in the long term it devalues your brand and that's why you know, you got that's why that's why Cadillac is 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 a much diminished brand. Uh, you know, Oldsmobile went away completely is because they followed in the belief that they were different. And this time they'd be able to extend the brand and have it work. And I and I would suggest that it wouldn't hurt. It would take a little more upfront money to launch a new brand and a little more effort. But I think ultimately they would do much better if they launched a new brand telling a new story. I would say that. I think that like traditionally when you decide you're going to go out there and create a a new a new line or a new product, it's because you're afraid of carryover from your existing product. Now by the way, Cadillac and Oldsmobile both GM brands and they were created to cater to specific markets. Um, in the case of of cars, you know, Toyota decided to come with Lexus because the problem is, is you're gonna be judged by the least product in your market in your in your product portfolio. If you have a crappy crappy product out there, even if it's aimed at a cheaper market, the quality of that is going to reflect across your entire brand. Toyota builds some fantastic products, but at the lower end in certain markets, they were producing very, very inexpensive cars that were known for thin doors, known for all these features and stuff that were not good, that were noisy, whatever, maybe got to where you wanted to, but was not considered a great, nice experience. And so when they wanted to create a nice premium brand, they said, we need to have a different brand name because we want people stepping on the lot. We don't want them thinking about you know the 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 Toyota you know the the base model Toyota Camry or whatever they stepped inside of last time. We need them to think of something different because that brand was embarrassed by that other brand, so to speak. I feel I think fundamentally that with Tesla, that I think that you know taking the Apple model where it's like no, we're going to put on this table the three hundred dollar product and the eight hundred dollar the nine hundred dollar version because we're proud of that three hundred dollar product. And if it suits your needs, you'll be very, very happy with it because we didn't compromise anything. Um, Could be wrong. I mean, uh, uh, I'll, I'll say this much. Um, you know, Toyota launches new brands. They're also the number one. They are now, after 30 years of that strategy, the number one car maker in the world. And so my guess is if that were true, somebody would be doing it the way you're saying and it would have no, worked for them. What, no, what am I saying? Because I'm saying that Toyota has to do that because they have cheaper brands. I'm saying there's a reason why Toyota, but the number one company in the world is Apple, which doesn't do that. So by your logic, Brian, 
if you apply to that. My but, point is again, is that I'm not Apple's, talking about computer. I'm not shitting on Apple, man. I, I, I know I'm, I like no, Apple. We all like Apple. Ryan, we're talking about the, the idea of a product model, of the idea of which do you do you, do you rebrand entirely or not? I say if you have consistent quality, you don't need to. With Toyota, again, where they are putting out eight thousand dollar cars to suit a certain market, they didn't want they, to try to sell a hundred thousand dollar car. If people were thinking of that car, that was a problem because it was a totally different experience. I think that, you know, I, my guess is that Musk, who idolizes the Apple model of things, will probably, I don't know, I have no idea. My guess is he's not going to create a new brand because he's proud of this brand and considers it across the board the same brand and this and Tesla being a technology. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, you, you might be right. I mean, again, uh, I, I, I think we're probably having two different conversations because you're saying what you uh, hope he, or you're saying what you think he'll do. And I think you're right. He probably will. I'm saying what I wish he would do, because I think that the other would be better for him and better for electric cars in the long run, because part of the the number one problem he has is the perception, the accurate perception that there's just no choices in electric cars. And if uh, and if you you spin off two different brands, even though they're both made by the same company, at least feeling like there's a bigger, more robust marketplace, I think would do better for electric cars in general. Who wants to do picks? <laughs> I I only have like five more minutes, uh, and then and then I gotta do some other stuff. But uh, I'll tell you, my pick my pick is uh, Andrew Maine's Angel Killer. So so very good, specifically on audiobook. It's very very well done. Thank you, sir. You're very very kind, very kind. Um, my pick is not a Brian Brushwood product, although although although. Uh, Last year, you did a really awesome holiday pack sort of thing. Are we gonna are we gonna find out about something like that? Yeah, there'll be some. Um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, it'll be plug a palooza starting next week. Okay, <laughs> and I, I'm gonna dip it. In all seriousness, that like if you're out there and you have an interest in magic and scams and things like that, what he puts together really, really is an awesome thing. It is an awesome collection of stuff. I have I have uh, some of these some of these devices myself that I may carry around with me should I perhaps encounter some sort of a <laughs> governmental influence or whatever. Uh, but anyhow, we'll, we'll we'll see on that. Um, in in until then, my pick is I found this on Netflix. It's a documentary series. I forget which channel it came out with from originally. It's called Inside Combat Rescue, and it's about this unit. An Air Force unit, and their job is in Afghanistan. When you get a soldier gets down, you have a soldier down, then all of a sudden, miraculously, medics appear, and then sort of the story sort of ends. Well, what happens next? Well, at Nat, Nat Geo, which I produce, produces some really fine programming, by the way. I hear that Nat about Geo, them. Yeah, it's a Nat Geo show, and so what happens is that there's this unit in, uh, in I think, in Kandahar of the Air Force unit, and these guys are in a helicopter. Moment they hear there's a soldier down or a friendly combatant down, they run into their helicopter. They fly to that location, often into war zones, into hot zones, and they have to deal with everything around there. They go in there, they render first aid, triage, whatever, and then take that person back to a medical facility. So you think about this: these guys are soldiers. They're armed, carrying soldiers in an armed helicopter who have to fly into combat zones, grab guys off the field, stabilize them with blood supplies, whatever, so they can survive the 20, 30 minute flight to the hospital. And this this series, what they do is they embedded some cameras and people with this unit to follow them as they go through it. And it is fascinating. It is absolutely I, I found it very, very riveting. In the second episode, we meet a character who takes us to his bunk to show us big heavy set guy, kind of looks like Chris Pratt, takes us to show us his bunk area. And there he has and this is a soldier on the front line saving lives. In his bunk, he's got a Star Wars bed sheets. <laughs> And he says, yeah, he says, this, depending on my, my mood I'm in, it can either be light side or dark side if I flip them over. <laughs> That's so, awesome. Um, really fascinating. So, And just to get an idea of what these people are doing over there. So, I tried watching a documentary about training the, uh, the Afghan army, and it was just too depressing. God, I love, and I love, I love Netflix for documentaries because documentaries are, are normally um, – you know, you, you don't know if it's going to resonate or be good or whatever, but Netflix just being in the ecosystem, there's such a low cost to entry. Like, you don't feel hosed if you get 20 minutes in. You're like, oh, I'm out. Forget this. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my pick. Anybody else have a pick? 
Uh, Brian, is your have you you you've officially have you officially announced the the big the new big product for for scam stuff? Uh, have you, you know what? D. Uh, we can we can tease the D. We're gonna uh, we're hopefully gonna send out the emails tomorrow. But if you're somebody who listens to this podcast, then uh, we can we can drop a, a fairly significant hint and pretty much say uh, what's going on. All I know is like I I got I got you know, this is stupid wallet i got wait wait let me see that let me see it i mean look at it. it's just you know it's just brown, brown, brown leather it's filled with money with well, that costs like a hundred a hundred bucks or something some kind of fashion brand how many tricks does it do uh it does the trick where my my license in, is in it oh, is does that, the trick where i have a credit card uh, so, so you can't do any magic with that like there's not a magical wallet huh wait oh. wait 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 hold on let me interrupt you for a second gentlemen so i have a friend He's an entertainer, and he travels around a bit, and uh, he often gets stopped, asked to perform. Sometimes very impressive people or whatever they want him to see. They want to see a magic trick, and he doesn't want to carry too many objects on him. He thinks it's gauche to carry decks of cards, things like that. He just wants to feel very natural in what he does, and he's been looking for some solutions for things to carry with him. He's very good at you know improvising with whatever's available, but yeah. he would love love it, some sort of magic item or something that's something he already uses. Man, for my friend, for my friend. Yeah, it just seems like if your friend had like uh, some kind of uh, fashionable wallet that um, had like uh, built-in magical mechanisms, like the ability to substitute one wad of cash for another magically, or or be able to like uh, do. Uh, do um, uh, uh, a, a mentalism uh, peak move or, or, or a, um, uh, maybe some amazing ability to make a card vanish appear in the wallet. It, those seems like the, they'd be pretty badass. I yeah, I think he could actually think of specific examples quite recently where he could have used one or more of those features and wish he had this thing. <laughs> and would be slightly angry that he didn't because, you know, anybody who had possession of this. I know, as I saw a man with such a wallet because he's <laughs> testing it out. Uh, cause he's going to sell it on his store <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, boy, howdy, was it just a real dream? So, uh, uh, I hope everybody goes, uh, to that man's store that looks a lot like scamstuff.com once the email goes out tomorrow. I will, I will say this also, like we're doing a, a special, uh, like they're all going to be numbered, uh, and, and they're, um, uh, there's uh, uh, like tw uh, 20 different glyphs for different uh, uh, instructions. But anyway, it's it's they're really really good, and we're doing a special like we don't know how much the market will bear for these, but uh, but so what we're gonna do is the first 100, uh, we're putting together a pretty sweet package. Is all I'm gonna say. That's that's all it is. That's all I'm saying. I'm buying one. It's that's all. Be... That's all you had to say. Yeah, uh, I want to buy one right now. Buying, and I mean, I'm gonna steal one when I'm in your house. That's, that's fine too. <laughs> I'm literally going to steal it. But then I'll leave money. Or so he said. <laughs> Amazing. I would like to buy one right now. <laughs> Soon. Soon. When will then be now? Soon. All right. So Brian has to go. However, I do want to make one more recommendation. Uh, we've talked long uh, about Neil deGrasse Tyson on this uh, here podcast. And we have oftentimes been critical of him. Uh we, and we were doing it before it was cool, for the record. We, oh, <laughs> man, we were way early on pooping on Neil deGrasse Tyson. Like, that was our bit from a <laughs> long ago. And not to say, I mean, we don't have to go into the entire Neil deGrasse Tyson conversation. However, uh, there has been kind of a recent kerfuffle that I, I feel, for those, if, you, if those conversations titillated and interested you, then go ahead and check out some of the stuff that's gone on recently with the, you know, some of the, quotes from his uh, regular lecture and uh, and how he has reacted to it. Is that your, your pick, is to just Google Neil deGrasse Tyson and we read that? Find that. It. I mean, it was what? The Federalist was the first one? Neil deGrasse. Uh, anyway, look. And the National Review Online has a really good re uh, summation of it. Uh, it's called The Perils of Being Neil deGrasse Tyson. And uh, it's it's kind of gets to the heart of something that has been, uh, uh, you know, a persistent kind of thing with with this show is that, you know, we are I, I like science to be a discipline and not a lifestyle. And I think there are very, very uh, problematic elements to making your lifestyle uh, 
something like science because I don't think I think it's a, I think it's a it's a weird fit and these are some of the cultural problems that wrap around that idea. Good pick. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I, there are some discussions that I fear to tread into publicly because the people who handle them do not handle them very, very well. <laughs> and, um, Andrew can be shy. Get at me, dog. Anybody what? wants to have a fight about Neil deGrasse Tyson? I'm waiting. <laughs> Go ahead. What Justin Get me up said. on Twitter. Just add Justin R. Young. Uh, <laughs> what Justin uh, said. We've talked about it a lot. Listen, we've talked about the Neil deGrasse Tyson thing a lot. It's not like he's a bad guy. It's just, it's problematic. And it, it, it is frustrating to me that it becomes the T-shirt and the bumper sticker when it's something as important as, like, I don't know, critical thought. <laughs> the fate of humanity. Yeah, I think that, that, you know, passing around F yeah science photos and things and, 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 and cheering anybody who's a scientist purely because of that uh, – it becomes, and that was the thing, when I was involved in the skeptics movement first in the 90s, the discussion came up like what happens when this becomes its own sort of dogmatism? What happens when science becomes scientism or the idea that we just promote something because, you know, it comes from the area, because it's science, scientists say this or scientists do that. And, and, and I've had some several realizations. One is uh, the vast majority of scientists I've met very, very smart in their own field. And when they step outside of that field, they're not much smarter than, and not the average person. They're smart. They're as smart as the average intelligent person in other areas, which is to say enough to think they know way more than everybody else. And I've had, I've had, I've had conversations with, with journaled people who, you know, let, you know, let's say in specific disciplines who are well known, considered experts in there within fields of, let's say biology, et cetera, like that, and who brought up – who said things from like asked like rhetorical evolutionary questions that were basic simple things we've covered here and they were totally ignorant of. And, and that because I realized it's not their area but they have no idea how little they know in that area, whatever. And that's the problem of any kind of science discussion. Once you're a scientist and you get on TV and you get to talk about things, if you're kind of an intelligent person, then you're, you'll talk about everything. And the problem is, is you have a very narrow specialty. And now people are going, well, this guy's a scientist, he knows. And then you find out these people. They well, and that's know. the thing, too, is, right, once you sound smart in one category, people just keep asking you questions and you keep feeling like you should keep talking. And then then you wade out into territory that maybe you're less of an expert in. And, you know, your supporters, if you if you say what's the politically appropriate thing to say, you know, your supporters will support you and you will be find yourself ignoring the criticism that's often very legitimate. And that's a dangerous place to be. And, and that's the thing we've talked about before. When, when we start treating science, when we start I – I, I started to get, lose my affinity, affili, uh, affinity for the skeptics movement when I saw rhetoric winning over the facts. When I saw that we were championing people who were writing these wonderfully moving emotional essays that were completely devoid of facts. When we were inviting people to come speak because they were fantastic speakers, not because what they said had content. And that challenging any of this or asking questions of this was considered, you know, don't do that because, you know, what's the matter? And it's that idea that if you have to exaggerate your position, if you have to change the facts or alter the facts to make your point, then maybe you're not in touch with reality. And then if you're in the business of defending reality, you're in the wrong camp. So. Here's a fun step everybody can do right now. Uh, make a point in the next week to... Tell as many people as possible that you're dumb uh, because it's a talk about what you're dumb about and say, I'm really not smart about this. And I, you know, if I'm interested in it, I'm going to look to learn more about it. Or better but, yet, um, better dumb, yet, a lot of uh, stuff. Yeah, not, not even a matter of dumb, like uh, like make it a point to to take a guess at what you suspect you might be very wrong about, you know, like uh, like even this. I might be wrong. Maybe uh, maybe maybe it is better. I'm both. What? I'm dumb and wrong about the vast majority of subjects <laughs> in my life. Like, I mean, and, and I mean, I'll say it loud. I'm dumb and I'm proud. <laughs> I think mean, the best thing is like is to say, what do you believe, and how would you criticize that? How would you? What's the most intelligent criticism you can have? We're very, very well trained in how to defend our positions and how to ignore facts, but we're not very good at criticizing our own. And that's the thing that frustrates me constantly is that. You know, in movements or ideologies or points like that, where there are these glaring deficiencies, there are these holes, and we try to cover them up and not acknowledge them because nobody has the monopoly on the truth. But if you're ignoring things, things like that, you know, what what do you hold? What do you cherish? How would you intelligently criticize it? 
Yeah. Anyhow. Gentlemen, it's, uh, this wasn't the most fun episode of Weird Things. What? what? But, but it was entertaining. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the tagline. That's not even close to the tagline. <laughs> yeah. Unless oh. you want to change it. Uh, it's your call, boss. If you want to make that the new, the it new was, closing. It was, it was kind of weird. <laughs> it, was, it was reasonably weird. Yeah. I have uh, two other awesome topics we'll get to next time. And, and, and Brian and I will not debate economics and brand Man, I, I tell you, I, I think, I think that, that we only realized at the end that it's like I was, I was saying what I was hoping for, and you were guessing what he probably will do. And so, and you, you well, were right. Well, but I mean, we're from, uh, from, we're not going to get back from, from, into it. From the point of view of what we thought was the right choice individually, you know, what we each thought was right. Yeah, correct. And with that, uh, I, uh, yes. We are of different opinions. And things.com. We can <laughs> that podcast. That'll be great. We'll just debate brands. Yeah. Say it. Say it. He already said it. No, he didn't. We're still recording, so he couldn't have said it. Um, it's been weird. Uh, uh, so... Uh, did you, I, in my long, long, long screed about what I wanted in an Apple Watch, one of the things that I desperately want is, and I, I was looking online in the Apple Store, App Store rather, to see if this was there, is I want a dictation software where I can just say something and then like tap my screen for like a period. Uh-huh. Yeah, you were talking about this, like, uh, like uh, I, I think this was in your essay uh, yeah, that you wrote yeah. about it, like tap once for a period, tap twice for an ex- or, uh, uh, a comma, or, or, and then like Something a swipe like for yeah. an exclamation point. Yeah. Because I was thinking about this the other day, like because voice, di- like the dictation in that, like the new version of Siri, so it's gotten much better. It's really, it's like I could, it's borderline usable for like u- making writing or taking notes and stuff when I don't have a keyboard. But it's just that I was Brian on my walked plate. into the podcast room. Period. Bonnie gave him a look askance. Period. <laughs> I like the green shirt. She said. <laughs> period. Yeah. No, I- I, I think you're right, and and I think that's something that you should keep talking about in the hopes that enough people bring it up that it happens. Because like I just want that too. Yeah. All, here's what we're asking for, computer nerds of the world, is when you speak to speak, you want to just be able to use the natural words you use. To have to speak punctuation is odd. It's weird, and it causes you know you cannot do the punctuation later on. Spend an inordinate amount of time correcting what you did. If you have screens, either screens on your phone, your Android, or your Apple Watch, or your Moto 270, um, is to be able to, I kid, um, is, the, uh, is to be able to just swipe as you talk, like just tap it for a period, use a long stroke for, let's say, a comma, a side stroke to do a new, new line, you know, double press for exclamation point or quotes or something. They're simple. You can come up with a very simple language of touching the screen, so you don't have to look at the screen to do it. You just touch it. Uh, yeah, nice. Hey, uh, what was that? <laughs> Good thing. Uh, hey, what are we calling this episode? It's going to be called, Is It Time to Panic? Or, Is It Time to Brand It? Uh, uh, is It Time to Panic, I like. Is that all right? Andrew? Yes. That's good SEO, too. <laughs> I like to experience this monthly period. <laughs> um. All right, gang. Well, good job, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Brian, I'm sorry I used hurtful words. Did you? I didn't hear any hurtful words. I thought it was I thought it was all above board. I thought it was all about the Benjamins. I thought it was all about wanting the D. She wants the D. Uh no no no. I I I I, I definitely felt like uh it was a respectful disagreement. I was not um uh bothered by it. I hope I hope I hope uh I hope it didn't. Uh, look, we've gotten in some arguments before. That didn't feel like an argument. That felt like a discussion. 
Goblin. Oh, sorry. I almost forgot to unmute that one. <laughs> uh, no, it's the whole reason we do weird things. It's so you and I can have pedantic disagreements on things. People go, what the are you about? <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny. I can tell you what's, what's funny is that uh, on the list we didn't get to, we'll get to next time, was Space Elevator News. Oh, damn it. And by the way... Uh, and uh, have two of those arguments in one episode. The universe know, well, and plus, also, you you won that argument. You've made me a believer with the three-stage, you know, return to Earth uh, 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 SpaceX system, you know, turning it into a commercial jet. I think I think you're right. Um, and I'm on, I'm on team... Uh, uh, Musk. Uh, autopilot, Team Musk. Until yeah. you hear next week's news. Yes, Brian. Maybe it'll change everything. <laughs> oh, damn it. Maybe I'm on the space elevator team now. <laughs> <laughs>